I've thought about what we're doing the rest of the semester. All right? And yeah, and that's the conclusion I came to. We're going to do fun stuff. So, and again, I don't mean this patronizingly. You, you know, this is a tough class. You guys have done a good job in it. And therefore, the last two labs I defined are very simple in my mind. But I don't have to do them, so. Yeah, the last lab essentially is do something. <laughs> do something we haven't done before. Press a button and make a coin flip, but show the animation of a coin flipping. Show it alternate between heads and tails if you want. Do something where you um, roll a ball around the screen based on tilting it if you want. I want you to pick and I, I want you to do, I want you to have two conflicting um, goals in mind here. First goal is to be kind to yourself. So don't pick something that's going to be too involved or too difficult. All right. But the second goal is to, to pick something that we have not done before. All right. So it could be an animation. It could be um, playing an audio file that we haven't done in a lab assignment. We may have done it in um, an example. Um, custom view, fragments. These are all possible things that you could do. If you're absolutely stuck, my suggestion would be to do something with animation because that's always fun. And it's pretty straightforward. What I plan on doing over the next while is to give you sort of a survey of some different things. And uh, again, um, the idea is is that you know we could talk about this forever, all right, and 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 only scratch the surface of the capabilities and stuff you can do. So I want to expose you to a number of things, and then I want you to pick one thing that's of interest of you and delve deeper on it. So. It's in a design and then finish mode. So your one lab will be just to describe to me what you plan on doing. All right? And it doesn't even need to really be a technical design. This is, you know, effectively a make, you know, a, a makeup call. It's giving you the opportunity to get some easy points in case some of the other assignments were hard. <laughs> All right? And then the final one is to actually do it. Uh, I also plan on having uh, opportunity for us to look at stuff in class. It would be a good chance for you to show off some of the stuff that you've done to, to other people in the class so that they can learn the stuff that, uh, that they need to do as well. All right. So let me, so that's what your last two assignments are. Now I know some are still working on some of the earlier assignments and that's fine. Um, You know, we will, you know, I will continue to try to give time and try to, to, to spend some class time answering questions as well as, um, you know, possibly having some days where you can come in and, and work. I did have a lecture on last Thursday. I had said it was going to be a work day. I was here to answer questions. There weren't any questions. So for the students that were here, I, I went over an example. I went over Deedle's Cannon Game, which I posted up to um, um, Canvas. And we might take a brief look at that before we go forward. Um, right. Okay, let's start out with, what are we going to do? We're going to try to cover three examples today. One is I'm going to give the Reader's Digest version of the Canon game. Two, I'm going to give the, uh, I'm going to show Jesse's splash screen for his Blackjack page. Because some people wanted to see like a splash screen or an animation, and he had mentioned that he did one, so we'll do that. And then thirdly, I'm going to look at we're going to look at uh, another example of a custom view. So the first thing I want to look at is 
and I'm going to not go over all the details. You can watch the lecture if you're terribly interested in this, but we're going to look at the canon game, which is not that. Canon game is a simple, silly little game that you run. And you get a cannon, and you get there. There's some bugs in here because that's sticking. Your aim is to try to shoot the blue and yellow pieces, and the black thing is your blocker. And apparently there's some difficulty with some of this. Ah. All right. Here's why I talked about this game. All right. This game is a great example of another instance where you would need to use threading. All right. We talked about threading before, and we talked about threading as sort of multitasking within a given task, right? We talked about multitasking on how your computer or your Android device could be playing music while you are sending an email, while your GPS is giving you directions of how to get somewhere, all right? That's multitasking, it's taking on three tasks at the same time, all right? And it divides up, the, divides up the processor's time between those tasks and gives each of them a little bit of a task. Certainly, the more powerful processor you have, the better it can do that. And the more resources you have, the, the more fully loaded phone that you have, the more that it can do this. All right? Now, uh, and, and if you have cases where it lags, it might be that you're asking your phone or device to do too much. I mean, I got sort of a low-end Android phone when my good Android phone broke, and now it really um, is really not the best, and I notice some applications really lagging. All right? As long as it can give each one enough time, though, you should be able to do them simultaneously from the perspective of a human. All right. Within a task, though, all right. Sometimes there's a need to split the processor's attention to different parts, different subsets of the task. And here's a classic example of this. All right. As we're running this, two things are happening. All right. One is that the pieces of the game are moving. The targets are moving back and forth. The blocker is moving back and forth. That's one thing that's happening. All right. The other thing that's happening is I can go and aim the cannon and shoot the cannon. All right? So those are two things taken together. Now, if you can imagine, pardon me? Well, the timer is part of the things moving back and forth. So the timer is included in that thread. All right? The idea, though, is we have the thread for the game pieces moving, including the timer, and then we have the thread that responds to the user's actions. If one had to run at a time, if only one part of this application would run, as the pieces were moving, the app could not be responsive to the user touching it because all the time would be taken by that, by it moving. So these are things that we want to run simultaneously within an application. So that is done via a couple of threads. All right. And if we're going to look at this, I'm just going to again hit the high notes, um, highlights. We have a Canon game, which is the GUI thread. All right. This, in this includes a gesture detector. Now, a gesture detector is um, something that can handle the touching of the screen. So for example, as I play this game, as I touch the screen, it aims a cannon. And as I double tap it, it shoots a cannon. All 
All right. So it's, it's, it's recognizing and noticing my gestures. And the other gesture that you can have is you can have a swipe. I don't know if that's, I don't know how you do that in the emulator, but anyhow, you can have a swipe gesture. So that's what the gesture detector recognizes. And if you notice, there is, just like with our event listeners, we have created a gesture listener down here that handles when I press down on the screen, when I fling the screen, swipe it, and finally when I double tap it. And all these things call methods in the Canon view. Now the Canon view is a custom view, all right, that runs in its own thread. The logic for it runs in its own thread. So really, the view for this app is this entire screen. This entire screen is one view, all right, it's a surface view. And the Canon view contains all the logic for moving the screen, uh, moving the pieces on the screen rather, creating the screen, drawing the screen, and so on. In other words, each cycle through, the screen gets entirely redrawn, believe it or not. Every piece gets redrawn. And then there are, there's logic to detect if the cannonball has touched the target, if it's touched the blocker, and so on. A lot of this is just basic math stuff. You know, they are making the cannon be a certain big, a uh, certain size, uh, depending on the size of the screen and so on. We have two pieces of this, update positions and fire cannonball. Fire cannonball, it gets called from the main thread, as does a line cannon. And update positions is what gets run from the other thread. So, down here, when we start a game, we actually... start the cannon thread, and the cannon thread simply calls over and over and over again, update position, draw game elements. Update position is what logically plays the game. In other words, it handles the shooting and the moving and all that. Draw game elements simply updates the screen to match what's going on in the game. So. Update positions logically moves those pieces across the screen, whereas draw game elements physically draws them on the screen. And this runs in its own thread, all right? Which means that both it gets time and the UI gets time. So I guess if I was going to say the, the key points that I want to get across from this example is number one, the gesture handling, how that was handled. That was handled through a separate class, which you should sort of see a common theme in an object-oriented world. That's how you handle something. You have a component that does it, all right? And if it's something that's common, it's probably going to be a component that's in the framework. And then the idea of this being another threaded application, where the UI and the background elements each run in their own thread, that will keep either of the two threads from monopolizing the picture, you know, and, uh, um, you know, ruining the way the game is supposed to work. You can review this and listen to the lecture if you're interested in it. If there are no questions, we'll go on to the next example. All right. The next example is Jesse's, who's not here today, is Jesse's blackjack game. Now, I think we already looked at either this game or his rock, paper, scissors, or one of them. But he added a splash screen to this, which really goes far into making the app look 
professional. So we go and run this. There's the emulator. Poker chip spins around, and then you're into the game. All right? So let's look at how he accomplished this magic. He has his main activity. Which he does all his blackjack stuff. There we go. His splash is also an activity. And this is defined in the manifest as the starting activity. In other words, when it's launched, this activity gets run. So what does this do? What does a splash screen do? In essence, this activity runs, let's, let's look at the code here. This is similar to what we did in the address book application because it involves creating multiple activities. So, we're going to ignore this stuff. This is all the stuff that it does to do its animation. We start an animation. We have an animation listener. The relevant part is this. When it is done, it creates a new intent to run a new activity, and then it calls the main activity of the game. So this is sort of, this is the launcher activity. This gets called when the application is launched. It runs, when the animation finishes, it goes and it calls the second activity, which is the actual blackjack game itself. All right? The animation. Let's take a look at that. All right. First of all, there's a view associated with it, which is a splash, XML. Let's see what's in that. All it is is an image view that draws a poker chip. That's the only thing in there, right? So, that gets set when the application opens. We grab a pointer to that image view, right? Which we've done this before in all the examples. We've grabbed the pointer so that we can do something to it. We then have set two animations. Two or is it one? Yeah, two. We set an animation called AN and an animation called AN2. All right? We'll look at the details of that file, those files in a second. We start the animation and we have an animation listener. All right? That animation listener does what listeners do. It responds to certain events, namely the last event is what we're interested in. When the animation is done, we start the second animation. When that finishes, we create and call our new intent. All right. 
let's look to see what those two animations are. One is described as rotate, one is described as fade out. So, let's go and run this. Let's watch carefully. Chip appears, it rotates. And then, I don't know if you could see it, but it faded out as the new view started. Now, the code to actually do the animation is included in the resource. And guess what it is? It is an XML file. Alright, we can look at the list of things that you can do in a animation file. Like any XML file, this has a root node, alright, which is set. It then has a number of things called, uh, that, that can go on, another of actions that you want to have happen. And we can look at this and we can analyze the properties. Duration is 2,000 milliseconds. So how long is that in real time? Two seconds. All right. From degree 0 through degrees 360. What does that mean? It means it does a complete 360. Pivot X and pivot Y is where the, is, is the axis about which it's rotating. In other words, if I just did a rotation, let's pretend this is a circle. If I just did a rotation and didn't specify it, it would rotate around the corner of that. And that's not what we want. We want it as though the axis was in the middle and to rotate around the center. So pivot X and pivot Y are set to 50%. 50% X is the middle horizontally, 50% Y is the middle vertically. So all we do in creating one way of doing animation, and again, there's a whole bunch of ways of doing animation, or there's at least several, but one way of doing an animation is to describe an XML file that you can go and apply to your visual controls. So in this case, we've defined an XML file All right. Or rotate. And we start that animation on the image. Again, separation. Separation between the visual and the functionality or the, the behavior. I can then go and apply this animation to a lot of different things if I want to, right? And all of it will do the same way. It'll be two seconds, it will rotate 360 degrees, and it will have the pivot point being in the middle of the object. So it's nice that we can define an animation somewhere, we can apply that animation to a whole bunch of things, all right? It's not like we create an animation simply for one element. So if we were writing a game or anything, we could apply the same animation to a bunch of different things on the screen. All right? And that's good. I don't think he included this uh, ABC fade out. I think that's why the fade out, I thought I saw it fading out, but I think I did not see it fading out. I, I think I was mistaken. Because I don't see the fade out, I just see the rotate animation. So he may have omitted that one. Now, what are some of the things that you can do besides rotate in XML animation? Well, it's the things that you would expect.
I've, I've posted a, uh, a link to another resource that we'll look at later, but we can look at this example too. I'll, I'll post a link to this one as well. Just to preview what some of these things do, again, here is the little video that shows the Android animations that this guy's code does. Fade in will make something fade in. Fade out will make something fade out. <laughs> Crossfade will make one thing fade out and the other thing fade in. Blink, don't ever use this. Zoom in. Okay. That's all the functionality that we'll do here. And I'll make sure I can copy this to resources. What's the code look like? Well, the code is going to look like the code is going to look like the code that you've seen in Jesse's example. In other words, we're going to create the animation and we're going to apply that animation to a particular element. And then we have a listener to, to to display if you want to do something when the animation is done. The real interesting thing relates to the XML and all the different things that you can do in the XML. For example, Jesse did a rotate. In this example, the first one to fade in, we change the alpha. All right. And what's the alpha? The alpha is how see-through it is. So we start out with an alpha of zero. That means it's completely transparent. And we go to the alpha is one, which means completely solid. So that's when you notice when the text faded in, you didn't see it at all. Then you gradually saw it more and more and more until it faded in. So we could go and we could put this in um, Jesse's code to make it, to add to it and to do a second thing. Let's go and try that. We'll go into his, why not? So I'll go and add alpha. Android duration. equals 2,000 milliseconds Android from alpha equals zero Android Two alpha equals one point zero. All right. Now let's go and run this and keep our eye on this. is fading in because I'm going from zero alpha to yes yeah, wrong blackjack Is there a way to do what? 
Yeah, you just uninstall the apps. I could go in, I could go in and uninstall any of the apps that I wanted to. Let's try running it again. All right, and it fades in while it's doing it. Now notice that the fade in happens as it's rotating. All right. So let's slow it down actually. Let's make it take 12 seconds. That'll make it more visible. So when you specify the durations, unless you specify an offset for the time, it assumes that each of the steps is simultaneously, simultaneous. All right. So there's ways that you can specify the offset so that you had it, you could have it, for example, rotate first and then fade out. All right. So you could put that all within one XML file to do the rotation and then fade out. And let's see, what would that be? What attribute is that? I believe it's called offset. Yeah, start offset. So, I'm going to make it so that this... doesn't start fading in. No, that doesn't make sense. Yeah, I'll, exactly. Make it one to zero. We'll we'll start it, and we'll go to zero. But our start offset will be twelve thousand. So what will the effect of this be? It will show. It will rotate, and then it will fade in twelve seconds. So the fading won't start until after the rotation is done because I've given an offset of 1,200 milliseconds. So it's going to wait 12 seconds. And in that 12 seconds, the rotation would have finished. So let's go and run that. So here we go. Going to rotate. Twelve seconds have elapsed, and it will start to fade. Until it fades out. And then the game starts. So we can chain these things together and give offsets so that certain things happen um, in different, you know, certain things happen at different points. We can almost make a little mini timeline here for that. Um, let's see what else we have. We have, we can change the size.
we can do a, a side. You see, this is, this is where this, this gets to be fun. I'm going to go and I'm going to make a scale, which is a resize. And then I'm going to say, from scale, I'm going to start off small. We can control the size along the X and Y, so we could resize it horizontally and vertically. And we can have this resizing happen along the pivot. And I can have it all take place 1,200 but with uh, 12,000 uh, milliseconds. But with no offset, this is going to be happening, the resizing is going to happen along with the rotation. So, this is the same thing that happened, I think, last year when I got to this unit. You just go crazy doing it, because this is just so much fun. So, if you don't have a better idea, do an animation for your last assignments. So the piece gets bigger as it rotates. And it fades. I really should get rid of that 12 seconds because that's an awful long time now. Why, I'm sorry, why does what? That is a good question. I don't know. It might be that It had the animation is finished, and that's an activity that happened after after the animation finished. It reverts back to its original state. I didn't notice if it did that before or not. It did each time. walking across the screen. All right. How would you do that? Um, if I was doing that, I closed my laptop. To do a cat walking. Um, or a ball rolling. A ball rolling would be easy. Would be a rotate. Would be a rotate along with a translate. 
All right. The one that we didn't talk about is a translate. And a translate is what allows you to move from one spot on the screen to another. So if I wanted to do a ball rolling, I would do a translate. Yeah, you could, you could do something like that. So, so the translate would be a rotate, like if it was a basketball or a baseball where the seams of the ball are, or like a beach ball, the different colors. As it would rotate, but it would also move. All right, and that would look like rolling. In fact, we could do that in this example if we, if we want. We could. Am I? I'm going to keep the rotating in. I'm going to get rid of the scale and the fading. And I'm going to put a translate. which mouse to grab on to. And I can specify from X delta, in other words, where from its initial starting point do I want it to be? Well, I want it to be at its initial starting point. So X and Y delta is going to be um, zero. Then I want to move this, and let's say I want it to go down. Down would be a Y coordinate. So let's go down, well, we can either do it in pixels or relative to the element width. Let's go down 25% P. That would be quarter of the way down the screen. And I'll make the duration also be three seconds. So I go and run this. I haven't lost my head. Oh, I forgot to change that to two. It rotates as it falls. So if you wanted it like to roll across the screen, you could have it rotate and go in the X coordinate if you want to have it that way. If you want to have it go down, you down and to the right, you could just give a value for the X and Y. All right. Now to make a cat walk, or to make like a stick figure walk. I think the best way to do that. What you could, I suspect the best way to do it would be to have two image views, three image views. I'm thinking out loud here. So, 
you'd have in animation there's always like the part of the image that's the part of the animation that stays the same and the part that changes. So I might make a body of the cat as an image and then I might make legs, a set of legs that were in this position and a set of legs that were in that position or maybe four legs and then I could rotate the legs or if you somehow made it look like that was the front leg and that was the back leg you could actually probably rotate that or flip that back and forth to make it give it the illusion of walking. I'd try something along those lines to do it in pieces. Have a, a static part and then a part that moved. Another thing you could do potentially would be to have two images that you flip between. Yeah, that you cycled real fast between. And you could, you could swap the opacity and just have them like out of phase. So in other words, like um, item one is, item one fades out in two milliseconds at the same, synced up with that, item B fades in in the same two milliseconds. And you might be able to do something like that. All right, so here's a good thing about this. Other than the initial setup here that he did of defining the animation, creating the animation object for it, applying it to his image view, and then writing a little listener about what happens when it finishes, all the work that we did was in the XML file. So once you apply the animation, you can, you can edit the animation and apply it to other stuff and, and add all sorts of features here. So you could make a ball bounce, right? You could have it do a translate down and then a translate up to do a yo-yo. Oh, there was? All right, well, let's look. I think by this they're defining the bounce as like making it bigger and then smaller, bigger than smaller, bigger than smaller. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Bounce.xml. Well, that's, that's essentially what we're doing. Right. So that would be something good to play with, um, just doing a, a, an animation and do that. And again, it does, have to, does not have to be anything elaborate. You can, for example, and this would be fair game for you, um, if you wanted to uh, rework one of your earlier projects to include animation, you're welcome to do that. So it doesn't have to be a brand new application. It could be something that you finished already. All right. Um, one thing you could do, for example, is at rock, paper, scissors. The one that wins, like if you have an image for rock, if you have an image for the computer, an image for the player, the one that wins, you could get bigger and bigger and bigger, and the one that loses, you could fade out. All right? And then you could do the opposite if the opposite player won. All right? 
And that would be just a case of having two animations, a fade in and a fade out, or a, or a disappear and uh, become giant, and then just applying those programmatically to the different things. All right. Okay. Last thing I want to look at is a custom view. Now, we've seen a custom view in the game, the Canon game application, and that allowed us to create uh, two frame, or uh, two threads, rather, that uh, would run. And there was one for the main GUI activity, and there was one for the game surface. This is a little bit different case. This is where we have a case of Let's say I want to change the way Android behaves. Let's say, for example, I'm a photographer and I want to do a watermarked image. You're all familiar with what like a watermark on an image is, right? So like you don't want people stealing your images. So sometimes they'll put like the name of their place smack dab in the middle of the image and then even if they take a screenshot or whatever they can't easily use their image without getting the watermark all right now let's say I wanted to do that to every image in my application one way to do that would be to manually edit every every image if I was doing a photographer's portfolio or something to put that watermark on there it's probably not a good idea right because that would be very 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 time consuming what would be better instead would be to have it and create a special kind of image. It's an image view in all respects except it's a souped up image view. It's an image view that we have extended to have additional functionality in it. Namely, the ability to apply a watermark. So, let me run this and show you first what it looks like and I notice there's a little problem with this, so we'll correct the problem, and then we'll move on. So let's run this. The problem is the watermark's almost impossible to see, which kind of defeats the purpose. But if you look, can kind of see the letters right there. Copyright, copyright. Okay. We probably would want that more across the center of the image and have it in bigger letters so that you can read it. So we'll address that. All right. Now, let's look at the code that we have to create this. First of all, I have a watermark image view. All right. Public class watermarked image view extends Android widget image view. What does that mean when we say extends? It means it's a subclass of image view. It is an image view, but it's a special kind of image view, which means that we can do everything we do to a regular image view, we can do to this guy, but it's going to have some additional behaviors. All right, and those additional behaviors are the fact that it's going to put a watermark on it. So, how do we put a watermark on it? Well, we override the on draw method. The onDraw method is what tells a view what to do when you draw that particular view. So we call the super onDraw method 
which simply draws the image because it's calling the ancestors draw method and then we draw the watermark on top of it. All right. Now, Try to make it bigger so that we can see. All right, there the watermark is a little bit more easy to see. All right. And we could change the position of it and do some things to make it display the way that we want it to. Now, I want you to notice a couple things. We're not going to go through this whole example today. We'll go over this example. We'll finish up this example next time. But, notice that if I look at my XML, I define that this is a watermarked image view from my package com.mikezellers.photographer. And notice I have all these attributes in there. All those, are, all those are the attributes that we can set on a regular image view which we can set on my image view as well because my image view, my watermarked image, is in fact an image view. It's just a special kind of image view. But notice that in addition to that, I can put my own XML attributes in. Namely, the position that I want the watermark and the size that I want the watermark. So, I can define the layout with my custom views just like I would define the layout with my regular Android views and I can supply values to the different attributes um, in it and that can set those programmatically. So for today what I want you just to understand is I'm able to take any view in Android and make my own version of it to add stuff to it. In this case I'm taking a regular image and I'm adding a watermark to it. I could create a framed image that put a picture frame around the image if I wanted to. All right, would be another thing that, that could be done. And then my framed image, in addition to having everything an image could do, it would have some properties relating to the frame that went around it. All right, so when you create a custom view, you're extending the current view that's in the framework, which means that your new view does everything that the old Android view could do, plus it does some extra things. And those extra things you can define in the different methods for that image, or, or for, for that custom view, and you can also set properties in the XML. Take a look at that between now and Thursday. We'll finish this up Thursday, and we'll go over some other fun examples um, of different fun that you can have with Android development. Any questions? about this. All these examples should be available. I do want to post this link because this looks like a good link as well. Alright, no questions? Alright, that's it for today.